Welcome to Lockdown Learning. My name is Ren Carlu and I am the Director of Public Affairs at the Zionist Federation of Australia. Now on Friday morning, we awoke to extraordinary news. As we all know by now, Israel and the United Arab Emirates will be signing a peace agreement in the next couple of weeks. Now, as everyone also knows, this is only the third time an Arab state has signed or has normalized uh, relations with Israel. And significantly, this is the first time that one of those countries doesn't share a land border with Israel. Now, tonight's conversation was scheduled well before that announcement, but we were extraordinarily lucky to have scheduled an insider who will give us his impressions of the peace deal and what it means both regionally and for Israel. Mir Bakat, now a Likud MP, was mayor of Jerusalem for 10 years from 2008 and before that a successful entrepreneur in Israel's high-tech startup environment. Now, I won't go too deep into his numerous achievements because we only have Mir for 45 minutes this evening and I want to get started. Mir will be speaking tonight with Yossi Goldfar. Yossi already has a long involvement with Jewish community affairs and he's only getting warmed up. He's been the Australian president of Vatar, chair of the AZYC, director of the Australian Institute of Jewish Affairs, president of the UJAB, and is currently a board member of Zionism of Victoria. I want to get started. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Yossi. Neil, thank you very much for joining us. We're very pleased to have you on this uh, edition of Lockdown Learning for the Zionist Federation of Australia. Neil, we all woke up and we're very pleased to see the news on Friday of the um, agreement with the United Arab Emirates, and we all hope that this will be a portent of things to come. I read in one, uh, one article that it, that it was referred to as a surprise announcement, but not unexpected. And certainly there's a lot of, his, there's a lot of history of some developing ties between the UAE and Israel, but I was wondering if I could get your perspective on how this agreement came about. Well, oh, first of all, I want to say thank you uh, for uh, hosting me and uh, hello from Jerusalem to all our friends in uh, Australia. Um, with respect to uh, well, the, the huge announcement that sort of came out of the blue, totally uh, unexpected theoretically, uh, I think I, I'd make a few points on that. First, it's a huge deal. Do not underestimate. Uh, take under consideration that after the UAE, uh, we may have Bahrain and other uh, countries as well in the Gulf um, create relationship with Israel. They already have some kind of relationship, but to have formal relationship is a big, big deal. Also, I think it demonstrates and proves that you can strive for peace, not necessarily um, in the methodology uh, that the Europeans expected from us, which is land for peace or give and give. Uh, and uh, the reality is that under Netanyahu, um, um, we're sort of, uh, we took another approach. The Likud, uh, the leading party in Israel, took a different approach, which is, uh, yeah, we need to be tough when we want, when we need to be tough, not give in to terror. Uh, be very aggressive with the, with the aggressive people, but also be very kind and, uh, and create relationships with people that are interested to, uh, to work with us. And so this deal for me represents much more than just the peace deal with a third Arab country, uh, maybe more to go. But it demonstrates and proves that the path we're taking, which is to be aggressive against the bad guys and good with the good guys, has its fruits. Uh, and this is something I think we should all realize we should maintain that strategy into the future. I, I think so. I, I was reading uh, this morning in, in the Jerusalem Post that they, they uh, mentioned that in addition to Bahrain and Oman, there was also talk even of Lebanon or um, Qatar following suit. Uh, Morocco was also mentioned. This could really bring in a, a new era for, for the region, which, which would be terribly exciting, I, I would think. Um, there's also been, you know, we had recently, I think last year, Miri Regev went to accompany an Israeli judo team to the Emirates. Um, there was uh, famously uh, an op-ed article by a, a, an Emirate official in uh, an Israeli newspaper a couple of months ago, all portents of what was happening. And then, of course, there was the, um, the Trump peace plan, which, you know, many people saw as being perhaps a little bit one-sided in, in Israel's favour, but clearly has, has 
probably also contributed to what's happening here. How much do you think it's been these ongoing contacts between Israel and the Emirates over the years? And how much as, as a result of the change in dynamic that the Trump peace plan brought to the Middle East? Well, definitely Trump and the United States uh, administration has uh, influence and, uh, and, and contributed uh, dramatically to this concept because uh, they're very friendly with both sides. And uh, I think that now uh, let's, let's all remember that uh, the UAE is uh, very in close in proximity to Iran uh, and they need the support from the United States and they need our support as well. And they see the upside in working with Israel. And so that relationship with the United States of um, pushing two allies of the United States to work together definitely has uh, uh, a lot to contribute. Um, now, the peace plan of the president, President Trump, um, is sort of, from his perspective, the American perspective, we share a lot of the uh, good in that peace plan, not necessarily everything. Um, I. Uh, for example, in, in the Holy Code Party, oppose having a two-state. Uh, we are fine with having uh, the Palestinians civil autonomy. We are fine that they develop and manage their own cities. Uh, we will never let them have an army. We will have full security support uh, and control. Uh, and what we propose, what I propose from my experience as mayor of Jerusalem, is to dramatically expand uh, the joint economy, develop more uh, industrial zones and more um, um, uh, tourism uh, related on Bible stories that we could uh, attract many, many people that both Israelis and Palestinians can gain. Uh, but by the definition of not having an army, uh, that means that they will not have a state. That's what we mean in the definition. So while we don't agree to all of the details of the plan of the, uh, of the um, President Trump, we certainly feel that it is uh, uh, balanced uh, much, much more than uh, minister, uh, than uh, prior administrations or the Europeans. And uh, hopefully now people see that w with that kind of support and relationship that we have, we can actually develop peace more than uh, prior administrations. So for me, if I could sum this up, okay, we commend President Trump for his uh, uh, leadership and relationship we have our own opinion on some of these issues, but we certainly accept entering a peace agreement with those fundamental ideas. We don't agree with them all, but it's a good beginning to start. And certainly I was struck when I watched uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's press conference um, a couple of days ago, how he made very clear that this was um, in Hebrew, shalom tmurat shalom, peace in exchange for peace, which was, which really, even if the, um, uh, bringing together with the UAE is perhaps not totally out of left field, then the um, then that model for a peace agreement is certainly game changing insofar as what's what's gone before it with the dialogue between Israel and um, and and other and other Arab countries. I was interested what you was talking about in terms of the economic benefits. Um, one of the things that struck me about this agreement is that it is even the heads of agreement that's been publicised is a fairly comprehensive plan that includes economics and flights and security and cultural exchanges and indicates quite a possible warm peace with, with, the, with the United Arab Emirates in the future. Um, given your high tech background, Nir, I was wondering if you can see that the next ways that comes out of Israel is backed by UAE dollars. Do you think that that's a new model for economic development for the region and for Israel? Well, there's uh, the high-tech sector in Israel, uh, the last thing it needs is dollars for, as investors. I think what you're probably going to see more of the high-tech uh, products in Israel find their markets in the UAE and in, in, in that whole region. Uh, you didn't mention security. I believe that security is another big issue mm -hmm. that Israel can export to, to that region, especially with the proximity to Iran. And those, uh, uh, they, live in, they also live in a tough neighborhood. And uh, we know a thing or two about living in a tough neighborhood and defending <laughs> ourselves. Uh, I also believe that uh, agriculture is going to be a major deal because uh, I've been working and seeing a lot of uh, technology uh, developed in Israel, especially in the Negev and in the South and in the Bika, uh, that uh, we call it desert tech. 
taking mm -hmm. technology in deserts and improving quality of life, meaning uh, food, managing of water, and, and, and energy. Um, now, naturally, deserts uh, could learn a lot from our ideas here in Israel. And I can go on and on. I believe that, uh, look, they're happy, we're happy if they invest, but the reality is that uh, the amount of capital invested in Israel, billions or five, six billion dollars a year, um, is they're not going to make a difference in that side, right. more in the customer side, I believe. It's certainly a, a stunning achievement, but any any work of this sort obviously um, brings about some opposition as well. And, and clearly we've seen that um, uh, the Palestinians, for, for one, have come out stridently against this. And, and, and you know, admittedly, most of their uh, rhetoric has been directed towards the UAE rather than to Israel in, in this case. But I was wondering you know, if perhaps there's not a, an optimistic uh, outcome of this, you talked about the annexation, you talked about the Palestinians, perhaps if with UAE and if countries like Bahrain and Oman follow closely after, um, would that perhaps put pressure on the Palestinians to return to the negotiation table? Is there a, a possibility for something um, enduring and meaningful with the Palestinians going forward from this? Well, one thing the, the Palestinians are learning from this issue is that uh, they cannot keep the Arab uh, moderate states hostage for creating a peace deal with Israel. And uh, the Arab moderate states are now saying to the Palestinians, hey guys, sit around the table, make a deal. Uh, the world is not gonna stop because of your demands. Um, that's the first point. With respect to, uh, so they're gonna have to learn uh, to, to use time wisely because time is not in the benefit of the Palestinians. Now, with respect to uh, um, sovereignty in, in Judea and Samaria, there are 430,000 Jews, Israelis living in Judea and Samaria. They're not going to go away. No. We're going to enable, enable Jews to live wherever they want. Uh, they could live wherever they want in Australia, in the United States. And in, in Europe, from my perspective, they could live anywhere they want in Arab countries. And of course they could live in the land of Israel, the land of the Bible. And so the right to live wherever they want is there and they're friendly. If you go to the industrial zones in Judea and Samaria um, managed by uh, Israel, you'll find 25,000 Palestinians working side by side to 15,000 Israelis. And I believe we can get 10 times more, 250,000 Palestinians working with 150,000 Israelis, and we're now want to develop industrial zones because in those industrial zones, you'll find Israeli technology and entrepreneurship and labor from Judea and Samaria, uh, uh, Palestinian labor and land that is cheap. And so companies thrive, companies that do need technology and labor thrive and succeed in those common uh, industrial zones. Um, so there's many, many good things to do and trying to uh, get Israel out will never work. Therefore, what we intend to do is just take those areas managed and controlled and where I I Israelis live in Judea and Samaria and apply Israeli law on them. We do not have any intention to apply Israeli law on a, a Shechem, a, uh, or Ramallah, or uh, Hebron, or any other uh, uh, Arab uh, city or town, and vice versa. So applying Israeli law is a natural thing to do mm. for people that really thrive to do peace together, that seek win-win, that seek how to make separation on the civil life, but working together on the economic life. And so I believe that uh, we did not give that up. We will follow through in, in the foreseeable future, in some time in the future. Um, but uh, for now, I think developing the relationship with the Arab moderate states is very, very important. Is there um, an estimation on that time frame now? I mean, clearly the government was ready to launch into an annexation process around now. And, and then obviously one of the conditions of this agreement is that there's a pause to that annexation process. Um, but you know, neither the Prime Minister nor President Trump nor anyone from the Emirates that I've heard has talked about what that time frame actually is. Do you have any um, inside mail that you can just tell us? 
Well, certainly uh, we will need a window of opportunity and uh, I'm sure in the future we will have some. I cannot uh, uh, anticipate when that may come, but I do know that uh, um, if uh, the window is closed because of the relationship, because of uh, the challenges in the United States mainly, uh, President Trump uh, a year ago was stronger and optimistic and uh, felt that he could take some risks, um, um, manageable risks, Right now in the election process and uh, with the uh, COVID-19 and the challenges he has, he uh, is not willing to take that risk. I, we accept, we understand that. Uh, we're not happy with it, but we accept and understand that. Therefore, if another opportunity comes to our table, uh, I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was very, very smart to take that opportunity. Mm. We could exploit that opportunity and uh, go back to seeking other windows uh, for uh, improving quality of life of Israelis in Judea and Samaria, uh, that will follow in, in the foreseeable future. I have a question from one of our viewers from Leon Pedepsky, who asks, if, do you see any issues in terms of um, Russian or even EU attempts to sabotage this deal because of their disposition towards solving a, a, the issue with the Palestinians first? Well, the world is divided to three here. Uh, you have pro deal, which is um, amazingly enough, not just Israel and the United States, of course, but you heard good words from uh, Jordan and from Egypt that we have peace, uh, 25 and 40 years. You heard good thing, good deeds from uh, uh, many, many countries that um, seek to have that fruitful relationship. Then on the other side, the other extreme is Iran, uh, Hamas, uh, the Palestinian Authority and Turkey. So the, that's the alliance, the, the anti-Israel uh, alliance. And a lot of the world is sitting there uh, somewhere in the middle. Uh, our goal is to expand the green countries, the ones that uh, support this deal uh, and influence the world. If we get critical mass of support from other countries that join this, uh, uh, this peace deal, it is a huge significant deal into the future. And uh, I believe long-term, it will also influence the, uh, negatively on the radicals, the radical Islam represented by Iran and, the, and their proxies. I certainly think it's a game changer, but I'm also aware that um, most, if not all of the settler movement has come out against it. I think the mayor of Afrat came out in support of it, but everyone else was pretty much against that. How does that impact on you as a Likud MK with the settlements being obviously part of the base? Does that concern you for the electoral fortunes of the Likud going forward? Well, I spoke to the majority of the leaders of, uh, of the Judean Samaria uh, last Friday, uh, two days ago, and said to them, well, you know, the window of uh, applying sovereignty has closed. Let's come to the reality. I told them that a month ago when I, after I did my due diligence in the United States and spoke to some of the officials there. Uh, therefore, it's not this for in exchange for that. This window is closed. And now there's a window open. Let's exploit it. Uh, I will be speaking for the benefit of improving, uh, uh, um, releasing more uh, land for growth for, for, the, for the Israelis in Judea and Samaria, for the natural growth plus, uh, because they're not a threat. And people see that uh, uh, the neighborhoods, the cities and towns, the, the Israeli cities and towns in Judea and Samaria, 430,000 of them, are not a threat. And if they become a million, they will still not be a threat. None of them will leave uh, their homes. And so if you thrive for a real, real relationship with a, a good relationship, a peace with the Palestinians, then if it's 430 or one or two million, that will not make the difference. Um, and so I am a strong supporter of helping them improve their quality of life, regardless of uh, of the fact that we are now did not apply Israeli sovereignty. Uh, it doesn't mean that we cannot enable them to improve their quality of life. They're not a threat to anything. If, if at all, they're Israelis that want that serve in the army, that to pay their taxes, and they should get equal treatment like me here in Jerusalem or anybody in the rest of Israel. But um, electorally, it's probably ironic because if, you know, I guess if the settlers who voted for the could move, they're not going to be moving to the left, they're going to be moving to the right. So on one hand, it, it doesn't really harm the chance yeah. of good to form a coalition. 
but on another ha- on another hand, it, it it weakens the base of the party. Is that something that is con- that is considered that you've considered that you've talked about with the prime minister? Uh, I think electorally, um, right now, the biggest challenge here in our country is the economy and uh, the management of the health issues. The biggest uh, challenge we have is how to um, bring the country back to growth and overcome the opportunity of COVID-19. Electorally, Uh this is a big deal. Uh, This this influences the big blocks. Uh, So if you look at the left of center block and the right of center block, um, the right of center block is uh, traditionally over 60 seats. Uh, not including Lieberman and uh, Blue and White. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so uh, we have to perform to maintain uh, that block. So people that are unhappy with the government right now from uh, Blue and White will go to uh, Yair Lapid and uh, maybe Lieberman. And the people that are unhappy with the performance from Likud will may, may go to Bennett. The blocks will maintain I don't see any major shift mm-hmm. in the blocks. And the Likud is uh, challenged from uh, the economic side and maybe potentially also challenged by uh, the, uh, the, the settlers. Although I believe that uh, long term, uh, they understand that the leadership of Israel, uh, the biggest um, party that could lead the country is Likud and nothing else because we're very, 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 very strong uh, uh, um, connection to uh, the field, to the cities and towns. The Likud is very, very active in all cities and towns, nothing even close in any other party. So we have very strong roots. Uh, and we're also Mamlakhti. How do you say Mamlakhti? Um, sovereign or um, federal? No, no, Mamlakhti is, uh, we look at the wide angle. We, we take care of um, all the residents. Uh, we have Likudniks that are. Uh, orthodox, uh, ultra-orthodox, secular, traditional. Uh, we include, uh, we're very inclusive in our approach. And that's one of the reasons why we're so, we're so strong. And I believe that if we play our cards right, we'll continue to lead the state of Israel. Now, I'm glad that you mentioned Corona because that's obviously uh, something, something I'd like to cover. And clearly here in Melbourne, we're in about a third of a way through a six week lockdown, which is, I think, uh, challenging everyone here and I understand that you too you're in isolation at the moment I am but it's coming towards the end and you're looking fairly healthy so I presume that you're yeah, I'm not sick well we're pleased to hear that but in Israel more broadly I think there's now up to uh, just a bit over 90,000 people who have contracted corona and unfortunately tragically about 670 have died and there's even though the second wave seems to have diminished a bit, there's still about a thousand or so new cases every day. Is that as good as it's going to get in terms of Corona? It's a very difficult virus to, to control, or do you see further improvements in those numbers over the coming weeks and months? Well, let's agree that it's a very tricky virus. Mm. Uh, And uh, I think Israel went well, did well in the first wave. And uh, then uh, um, when we let go a little bit, maybe a little bit too fast, government released it a little bit too fast. The second wave is, uh, is larger, uh, bigger, yet uh, it doesn't grow faster. It actually is slowly but gradually decreasing a little bit. The growth, the, 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 you know, it's, the instead right of growth, part. you've got, uh, yeah, negative growth. Uh, it's a big problem because I, I personally don't, like to see shutdown. Shutdowns are very costly and we need to uh, better understand how to live with the virus on uh, how to have uh, um, each of the Israeli citizens more obedient. Uh, Israelis are not very obedient to the law in these issues and uh, we must be much, much more obedient. And the second thing is we need to open up uh, wisely uh, elements of our economy uh, and not except lockdown after lockdown. Lockdown is an easy solution. It works short term, but then once you open it up, if you don't manage and control it well, it, it comes back. Second wave could be a third wave mm-hmm. until there's a solution. So I'm from the, the school of thought of people that believe we have to manage it better uh, and 
and it's you know the devil's in the details sure manage the details of what's allowed what's not allowed in each of the areas of each of the economy we open up either maybe schools or um, um, industry or trade uh, and public uh, spaces etc it has to be managed and there's a lot we need to learn as public uh, I'm optimistic I believe we'll overcome this issue uh, and uh, the biggest challenge is how do we very, very quickly, as much as we can, go back to swift growth. We had 3.5, 3.4% unemployment before the uh, corona hit us. Uh, right now, we're, we're 21%, which is amazing, unfortunately bad. And we need to very, very quickly put the country back on track on the economic side. I want to get to the economics of, of the recovery from the coronavirus in, the, in a moment. But um, just reflecting what you said, I think that the... Uh, you were talking about the obedience and the discipline of Israelis to maintain things. Uh, I just wanted to share with you that here, it, 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 it's no different really. We've had, as I said, a couple of weeks of lockdown. We're in the middle of winter, but yesterday was a particularly sunny day and we saw lots and lots of people out there and, and we're obviously hoping that that doesn't lead to a second wave. Um, I know that the summer holidays are coming to an end and that the traditional start date for school, the first of September is approaching. Is it the government's intention that children return to schools physically this coming this coming year? Um, yeah, that's what I hear. Uh, mind you, I'm not in the government. I'm a parliament member. But what I do hear that um, uh, the government intends to open up uh, definitely the uh, elementary schools until fifth, fourth, fifth grade, and then uh, consider um, um, for a few months working. Uh, from home, uh, remotely. Um, and so it's still on the table because the changes needs to be made uh, physically and in the, me the methodology of management. How do you manage uh, uh, such a, a challenge? It, uh, it reflects on uh, the hours that people, that, uh, and, and you know, I don't envy the principals in our schools. They need to be challenged in a, in, in a way out of framework. To, to create mm -hmm. the framework that uh, they could uh, teach all the kids. But then again, you know, we adopt very quickly. We learn very quickly uh, and it's not gonna be perfect, but hopefully the answer is that it will be open at least in early stages, in, in early ages. Well, I think that we all feel that the sooner we can get back to normal, the sooner everyone will feel better. Not, maybe not physically, but mentally, I think that, you know, return to normalcy would be welcome. In terms of the economics, you mentioned the high unemployment rate in Israel, and I've seen uh, one report, I'm not sure as, as to its accuracy, but said there's now a million unemployed in Israel, which is a, a huge number, especially given the relatively relative small size of Israel's population. And I know that you've put a, a pretty impressive plan on the table to, to the Knesset to, um, you know, which in the headlines talks about an investment of 68 billion new Israeli shekels, which for our Australian viewers is about 28 billion Australian dollars, and hoping to bring, using that to get 500,000 people back to work. The plan is based on three anchors, as you've termed them, termed them. Can you perhaps describe for us what those anchors are and how they interact with one another? Well, first, Yossi, I'll say you're a good student. You've learned the... You've seen and learned the plan. Yeah, well, the plan calls for I'm, three... I'm an economist, uh, so, you know, it interests me. <laughs> yeah. So the three anchors are complementary to each other. They influence each other. The first is very, very um, simple. You focus on the companies at risk. Uh, you learn the VAT. Uh, the uh, companies in Israel report uh, their VAT every second month. Mm -hmm. You compare their VAT uh, report to last year or last two years, if you'd like, on the average of the last two years. And companies that their uh, um, revenue decreased by over 50% will have significant help, which is about, uh, we try to focus on half of their loss. Give them immediate cash injection of half of their loss and enable them if they want to get some loans from the bank to complement it so that they could survive the period of uh, the coronavirus. Mm. Now, if we don't do that, then they go bankrupt and you can never return employees to a company that went bankrupt. So by saving 
uh, minimum 60,000 companies at risk. Uh, you're actually saving 250,000 jobs that you could then return uh, the minute uh, the, that we're over the wave. The second anchor uh, is uh, very interesting and challenging. It calls for um, taking over 100,000 people and uh, train, retrain them for new careers. There are, uh, before um, uh, the coronavirus in, in Israel, we had uh, 150,000 jobs that Israelis did not want to go uh, to, to work in uh, construction and in, in the public transport and in agriculture and many, many other fields that uh, because of 3.4% uh, uh, unemployment, you could get these employees. But now uh, from the over, um, almost million people that are seeking jobs, I promise you 100,000 will go through that training process sure. and find new careers. So that's the second anchor that we have to... Uh, uh, to, to develop and the if role I might, of the government. If, if I might say, Neil, I think that the, the component of that program that, that links the training to make sure that that's the need of the employers and not someone yeah, else deciding, I think that's really yeah. the key for success. 100%. Right now, all the training is done by the government, uh, which is about 12,000 people a year with uh, maybe 20 to 30% success, which is two and a half, three, four, five thousand people a year. That will, that will not suffice. You need to think out of the box and that's what we've done. And I work with the public, uh, private sector in, in our country, all the big employers, and they're willing to take responsibility on defining the training and actually training people by themselves. May it be in the, uh, in, in the workplace, uh, may it be something that, you know, they join together a few people that have similar needs, but to take control of the process. And in that process, you do matching funds with them. You do private public partnership uh, with the government and, and the private sector. And that will bring us big numbers. That can bring us over 100,000 people in the next two years. Mm. Um, definitely gonna save a lot of money and uh, save a lot of people that uh, uh, will never be able to go back to the work they had before because the workforce is, uh, labor force has shrink dramatically. Uh, and uh, many of the employees will not go back to the numbers they had before. Uh, and the third anchor is uh, punctually um, seek to create demand, support demand. Once we get out of the coronavirus, meaning once we see a bit of, uh, um, how do you say, uh, blossoming future, an optimistic future, then the government should help uh, um, subsidize and create demand on the demand side. So it will boost companies to return and hire uh, people that they've hired before and make the economy move faster. That itself, and if it's done wisely, could return uh, uh, over 150,000 employees um, fast within the, the first half year, once the coronavirus is, uh, we will see it uh, in the back mirror. Uh, I mean, uh, that uh, we'll have a solution on the health side. I'm sure that will come. And you need that third component. So if I sum it up, my plan calls for saving businesses. There are partners. They should be viewed as the, the engine for growth and make sure that we're there for, for them on the downside. But once there's going to be upside, they'll, the return on investment, they will know that they, could re, they can invest and they're not alone uh, and save those uh, points. Uh, retraining of people and focusing on uh, expanding the demand side um, at the right time. So that's the comprehensive plan. I have to admit that Prime Minister Netanyahu loves it. Uh, he's implemented um, the first element, which is the saving of uh, businesses. And uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, we invested 20 billion shekels. We passed in the, in the parliament, focusing on helping uh, large and small companies and, and independent people, uh, which helps. There's still big holes in the net that we have to close, but the first steps are made and hopefully the next few steps will be made in the next few weeks. You mentioned the Prime Minister like the plan, which is great, which is great, I'm sure, for you and for the plan. Um, but he also asked the Treasury to put, to put together a plan. How do these two plans work together? Well, I'm a big, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, um, uh, I oppose. 
opposed. Yeah, I'm a big, I'm a big, big opposition to uh, the way that the, the Ministry of Finance has uh, developed their plans in the first three, four months of the coronavirus. They were stingy. They felt that they need to save uh, um, uh, the, country, the public money um, because they saw helping other people an expense. I beg to, beg to differ from them. I believe that saving companies is an investment. And therefore, we should invest in the, in the, down, downside, in the, on the, on the downside when they're so tough. The country needs to invest in businesses. It has to invest in making sure that we have very little um, um, bankruptcies in our country. And so I think of it as an entrepreneur and as a business people, as a person and somebody that manages the city of Jerusalem, uh, we had similar challenges before. I'll give you an example. In 2014, when I was supposed to go to Australia, uh, and unfortunately because of the uh, security channel, I think it was 14, I, I couldn't go uh, because of security issue. Tourism in Jerusalem has dramatically decreased. And so we came to the government and they gave us 70 million shekels and we created a formula that every um, business that their revenue went down over 25% relative to last year, will get in a cash injection, injection of two thirds of his loss. And we invested 70 million shekels. Uh, the businesses did not go bankrupt. And four or five years later, Jerusalem has become the fastest growing tourism city two years in a row in the world, in the world. What happened was that the investors in the tourism industry felt that the country and the municipality is on their side and the return on investment becomes much better in such a process. And so I gave that example to the Ministry of, of uh, Finance that uh, you must look at this as an investment, not as an expense. Therefore, don't be stingy because you're going to get exactly the opposite of what you want because the cost of recovery is going to be so much higher if you don't do these initial steps now. And certainly your plan talks about a return on investment in one to three years or what have you. But sure. One thing exactly. I was wondering, and I know we've only got and, a and just, uh, Yossi, just so, so, so just let me finish that. And so Netanyahu saw it. And uh, after a few months that he realized that it, it doesn't get us the right solution. And uh, all of a sudden there are, uh, uh, there are demonstrations in the streets and people are, are really raising a red flag. He got and jumped in decided to take leadership. And as they say in, uh, in Hebrew, went over their head and uh, made it happen. And that return on investment, and I think the plan is very strong, especially because it does, even though I put myself personally more on the Keynesian side of the economic scale, I think that it's certainly true that ultimately it's the private sector that creates jobs and they're really the ones that need to be leaned on yep. to to, to get those people back to work. But it will take a while. And I'm aware that things like unemployment assistance in Israel only last for six months, which will leave possibly hundreds of thousands of people without any, any kind of support until things kick off back again, maybe at the end of next year, at the end of this year or next year. How can the government make sure that those people can feed their children, can pay their rent? How, 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 does, how does that survive during this? The, well, Israel uh, has a strong safety net to people that lost their jobs. Um, you have uh, unemployed people, but also the majority of the million people that are unemployed are under the term of khalat, uh, it's vacation with, without pay from their jobs. And the government pays them as if though they're unemployed. So they're still recognized as employed by the people, their, uh, their company, although the company does not pay them anything. Uh, and the structure, the, the pro uh, on this structure, the, uh, the good thing about it is that once things get better, the return is very simple. People are, have their job and they can go back. Uh, the negatives about it is that uh, the, sometimes the people claim that the people that are now unemployed or that get their uh, money uh, from their company have no will to return to work 
or God forbid that it pushes people to work in, uh, in the, uh, without reporting to the government, which is black, uh, the black market. And so it has some negatives to it. Some people that let's say uh, currently get paid from the government, um, assuming that some of the employees pay them on the side and they have no motivation to change the structure. And the government takes on a big burden of the pay. So Israel will have to overcome these issues. But all the solutions to this problem, to these uh, challenges, is get back to economic growth. Once you get back to economic growth, you could back, go back to normal. This may take uh, another half year or maybe a year. That's fine. Uh, we will do whatever it takes and wait patiently uh, for that uh, time to come. So the, the people of Israel, the people that are unemployed, have a partial solution to the uh, to their uh, to their quality of life uh, it's far far from what everybody wants to be but that's the reality at this point we need to improve it i admit we need to improve it also, that as well uh, hopefully that'll be done soon we only have a few moments left but i wanted to ask you to turn the conversation to the future of the government we've seen for the last eight weeks or so these really large-scale protests outside the prime minister's residents and in other locations around the country protesting against Bibi personally rather than perhaps the government per se. Um, what do you think this means for the liquid? What does this mean for the government going forward? I would separate the, uh, the demonstrations to two kinds. The one kind is professional. Hey, uh, we have, uh, we're fighting for our business. We're fighting for our pay. We're fighting for bread and butter. That is something that uh, I understand. And uh, I try to be the voice of these people as a parliament member and ministry of, uh, in, in the, in the uh, finance committee in the parliament. Uh, we have many, many challenges and many, many arguments, but I try to bring those voices to the government uh, and to the prime minister, um, again, to, give those solutions that the majority of the um, finance ministry clerks uh, and management disagree with me. But again, it's our responsibility. Our responsibility meaning the government and uh, the coalition. Mm. Then there's another uh, kind of demonstrations which are very political. People that are on the left that did not vote for Netanyahu, that want to see Netanyahu uh, leave office, um, it's certainly uh, their right to do so when we must enable them to demonstrate. Uh, I don't think it's gonna help them because you don't change uh, government through demonstrations, you change it in elections. And we had three elections in a row and the people of Israel said, uh, you know, put their ballots and uh, mm. support Netanyahu. Uh, those folks, uh, you know, they can, uh, they can continue uh, demonstrating um, this is something I do not identify with because it's political and not professional but it's their right fair enough um, just one uh, I know we've probably got a little bit over time but if you've still got a minute or two um, Neil who President Rivlin's term ends in June next year um, maybe I'd just like to cheekily ask who do you who do you think will be the next president of Israel and do you um, would you like to comment on that? No, there's a, a much too early and I would not speculate. I don't even know who is going to run. Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I presume, you know, the reason that I, that I've asked you this question and that's because in some circles has been talked that, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu will transition to, um, the presidency come, uh, the end of, of Rubin's term. And for you, for someone that has, espoused your own leadership ambitions. I was just wondering if you had any time frame for, for that in terms of um, where you'd like to see your role in the Israeli government over the coming years. Well, um, they say that in the Middle East, it's hard to predict the past. So <laughs> it's a bit difficult for me to really predict what's, what's gonna happen. And, uh, you know, last week, uh, Netanyahu uh, pulled out not a rabbit from his hat, but an elephant from his hat. And so it's very difficult to see and, uh, and, and plan the future. 
However, me personally, I see myself as a loyal supporter of Likud and Netanyahu. Uh, and uh, um, if uh, there's another window of opportunity for him to uh, put me in a position in a, in a significant position in the government, I'd be happy to join. Otherwise, I'm very happy with what I do today, which is I have more time to plan and to uh, develop uh, uh, um, um, our, my ideas, my independent ideas into the future. And now once Prime Minister Netanyahu will decide to leave, then um, the, our internal Likud uh, uh, internal laws says that uh, there's going to be uh, um, a challenge for leadership uh, primaries. And I intend to participate in those primaries and win. And hopefully, uh, I'm not in a rush. I support Netanyahu and I'll do everything I can to help him continue lead the state of Israel as, as much as he can. Um, but then uh, once that will happen, I'd, I'll step in and uh, I believe I'll do that with God's help. Well, I think we'd be very interested to, to, to look at your career from between here and wherever that comes. It, you know, we... Um, we, we were aware that you were talked about as a possible finance minister, so you would have helped your economic plan get more, get more um, implement, get more, get implemented more quickly. Um, but um, we also um, wish you the best of luck, and you know, hopefully, between now and when you stand for prime minister, uh, as you've said, um, you'll find time to um, come to visit to make that visit to Australia that you didn't quite get to a few years ago, and would love the chance to speak to you further when you do. Once they open the skies, hopefully soon enough, now there's a direct flight from uh, yes. Israel to Australia. Melbourne. At least one way, at least one way. And so- uh, We were very excited. I'd be, happy. When, when, when I'd, I'd be very happy to take that plane uh, once we can uh, go for some time and maybe spend some vacation and uh, quality time with your folks um, in Australia. And, and last, uh, I wanna thank you, um, the Australian Jewish community it's very loyal, supportive community, Zionist community to Israel. I remember when I was mayor, how you folks helped us in, in the city of Jerusalem. So I want to take the opportunity and thank you, really from the bottom of my heart, for your friendship and your uh, brothership uh, uh, and uh, working together. And, uh, you know, hopefully with, God, uh, with God's help, we'll, we'll have better days uh, soon enough and many, many opportunities to work together. Well, we wish you all the best too, Nir. And, um... You know, maybe just reflecting on what's happening, you know, we, maybe um, hopefully in the not too distant future, we can fly direct to Israel on El Al from Melbourne and then come back via Dubai and Emirates. <laughs> well said. I'd be happy to do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Neil. We, we're Pleasure. really grateful for your, the time you've given the Australian Jewish community today. Thank you. Shalom, shalom. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Nia. And Yossi, Yossi, you took the line I was just going to use to wrap up the conversation, so I'll, I'll skip right over. Um, thank you both, uh, Nia, once again for your time this evening. Um, you were only going to give us 45 minutes and you've given us uh, well over 50, so, so thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Yossi, uh, it was wonderful to My meet pleasure. you. And, uh, and thank you for, for moderating our conversation tonight. Now, next week, we will be speaking with Professor Gil Troy, who is a Zionist philosopher and intellectual. He is the author of nine books, including The Zionist Idea. He is a professor of history at McGill University in Canada and a research fellow at the Shalom Hartman Center. He also visited Australia this time last year and spoke at the ZFA's plenary conference. I'm sure many of you, or at least uh, a good proportion of you, uh, saw him last year, and so no doubt we'll be excited to see him again. Of course, flights are cancelled at the moment, but we are delighted that we can still bring him into your living rooms. So on that note, uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Stay healthy, and we will see you again next week. Good night. <laughs>